Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. I'm going to continue my reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. And for continuity, I'll back up to the beginning of the paragraph where we concluded yesterday. The subject currently being discussed is the comparison and the contrast between the papal form of government, that is, monarchy, divine right of kings, monarchism, uh, popery, that's what it is called, top-down government, an authoritarian government that imposes its will upon the people. No consent of the people is required. None is accepted. The Pope, by divine right, rules as he sees fit as the representative of God on earth. That is the papal system, as opposed to the Protestant form of government, which uses conscience, and the Bible is the basis of its government. It is by the consent of the governed. Protestantism is the root from which springs republics. Constitutional republics like the United States of America. The papal form of government is imposed by force. It does not require the consent of the governed. It is imposed. The republican form of government, the Protestant form of government, uses no force because it has the consent of the governed. It is government of, by, and for the people. And because of that, the people willingly abide by the laws of the country because they make the laws of the country. It is in direct antithesis to the monarchical, papal form of government. R.W. Thompson makes this point better than any author I've ever read on the subject, and we'll continue now. If you're following along the last full paragraph on page 60 in the book, he says, Other governments besides ours have founded on the popular will, on the right of the people as the source of civil power, to prescribe their own form of institutions. Before the Christian era, the Romans and the Spartans recognized the efficacy of the doctrine that, quote, the safety of the people is the supreme law. But they were unable to secure its establishment as a distinctive and permanent feature of their governments because they failed to cultivate that sense of personality out of which grew the virtue and intelligence necessary for the support of popular institutions, that is, free institutions. Popular being a word to describe the consent of the governed or a government that is favorable to the people. That's what makes it popular. All right. Unfortunate, however, as their failure was for the world, the avowal of the principle gave rise to influences which were never entirely destroyed. The idea of government upon which they unnecessarily experimented struggled, or excuse me, they unsuccessfully, let me read that again, I'm sorry. The idea of government upon which they unsuccessfully experimented struggled along through succeeding centuries, even through the Middle Ages, awaiting a favorable opportunity for ultimate and complete development. It has always had many able and zealous defenders in the countries considered the most enlightened, but they have been kept down by the governing classes who employed the combined authority of state and church to intimidate and subdue them. We're talking about the fact that there have always been proponents of popular government, government of, by, and for the people, but that they have been kept down and suppressed by the papal system. 
by the union of church and state, the union of the Roman Catholic Church over the state. That is, the monarchical system has always suppressed and kept down any talk of a popular or a, uh, a bottom-up form of government. Now, this combined influence was for a long time sufficient to hush almost every murmur of complaint against misgovernment, except among the few who dared to defy it at the hazard of their lives. Now and then, one of these intrepid spirits appeared and flung his censures into the very teeth of royalty. And if he paid for his boldness by the forfeit of his life, others of like courage arose to take his place. And thus the line of patriotic succession was kept unbroken. They were few in number, but enough of them to keep the fires of liberty aflame so that they might flash in the eyes of royalty. The world would, centuries ago, have been turned over entirely to cruel and exacting taskmasters and sunk into utter political darkness, but for the bravery of these defenders of popular freedom. Comprehending the true philosophy of government, they maintained that every man in a free state ought to be concerned in his own government and that the legislative power should reside in the whole body of the people to be exercised by representatives responsible to them, and that in order to support and preserve this theory of government, each individual should be allowed to speak his own thoughts, employ his own reason, and consult his own conscience in reference to all matters concerning his duty to God. The great difficulty which so long lay in the way of impressing these sentiments and principles upon the governments of Europe grew out of the compact and unbroken union of state and church, a union which found its only means of preservation in the denial and in the violent and forcible suppression of every kind of popular and political freedom. The antagonism between these opposing principles was too irreconcilable for compromise, and the stronger party prevailed over the weaker, the kings and the popes over the people. But the framers of our institutions escaped this antagonism only by the occupancy of a new and remote continent, and therefore were perfectly free without any immediate fear of it, to make the principles so happily expressed by Montesquieu the basis of their political action and organization. In the Declaration of Independence, they asserted it by declaring that in order to secure, quote, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, unquote, it was necessary that governments should derive, quote, their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, that is, the consent of the governed, it is the right of the people, and I add the words, it is the duty of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect their safety and happiness, unquote. This act of independence is esteemed to be one of the great events in history and has commanded the admiration of a very large portion of the civilized world. It did not create a government but asserted the right of the people as distinct from that of kings and princes and popes, whether of state or church or high or low degree, to establish and maintain one of such form and structure as, in their opinion, was most conducive to their own, quote, safety and happiness, unquote. Those who assail this great principle whether they be native-born or adopted citizens, 
deny the wisdom and impeach the integrity of the founders of the Republic. They aim their blows at the central column upon which our national edifice has rested for nearly a century in the face of opposition from all the allies of monarchy. Has the time come when this edifice shall be permitted to fall, or these blows be continued with impunity? They know but little of the temper of our people who suppose that they may not be pressed too far upon a question of such vital importance. Within its proper sphere, they have assigned to each department of their government its own appropriate functions in making, interpreting, and executing the laws. Above and beyond, and higher than all these, they have retained the sovereign power in their own hands. They will allow their reason to be appealed to in favor of new laws and the change or abrogation of old ones without any exhibition of intolerance on account of differences of opinion. They live, and their intelligence and patriotism are increased in the atmosphere of free discussion. But when the effort is seriously made to snatch this sovereign power from them, to dwarf them into inferiority before a foreign potentate, and I will add, like the Pope, that's who he's speaking of here, to dwarf them into inferiority before a foreign potentate, to exact from them obedience to laws enacted without their consent, to erect an ecclesiastical, and I will add the word popish, tribunal in the midst of them, answerable only to the laws of the Roman Curia, and to surrender up the inestimable privilege of self-government, then toleration ceases to be a virtue and becomes a crime. If the people of the United States in the progress of their history have demonstrated anything, it is that such institutions as require the least degree of force and coercion are best adapted to improve and elevate mankind. And they who pretend that the proper supremacy of law is inconsistent with such institutions are either ignorant or insincere and unworthy in either case of being entrusted with their management. No political institutions can be safely given over to the care of those whose principles and sentiments are in antagonism to them. Monarchism cannot mingle with the principles of a free republic. Let me read it again. Monarchism, that is, popery, cannot mingle with the principles of a free republic. Now, I've equated, let me interject, I have equated, and rightly so, monarchism with popery. That's the subject of this whole book. But I also equate, and it should be understood by now, that a free republic is equivalent to Protestantism. So with that understanding, we must understand that popery cannot mingle with the principles of Protestantism. Now, continuing with the text, it says, Liberty and slavery, that is, Protestantism and Roman Catholicism, cannot exist together. The people cannot govern in their own right where ecclesiasticism, or that is, priestcraft, popery, governs in the name of divine right. Let me read it again. The people cannot govern in their own right where ecclesiasticism governs in the name of divine right. So R.W. Thompson has put it to us plainly. Which is it going to be? Because you can't mix the waters between popery and Protestantism. 
What will you have? Will you have liberty or will you have slavery? Those who seek monarch, monarch, uh, monarchism, those who seek a top-down government, uses the basis for their authority, the divine right of kings. They assert that they have been placed on earth with God's will inherent in them, and that it is their religious and civic duty to rule from the top down. That's the divine right of kings. It all comes from this so-called idea that the Pope is a successor of Peter. And Peter was chosen by Christ to be the head of the church. It's nonsense. It's not in the Scriptures. Who is the governor? Who is the rightful governor of God's people but God alone? And he has no earthly vicar. He has no earthly replacement. Again, R.W. Thompson says, The people cannot govern in their own right where ecclesiasticism governs in the name of divine right. The science of government involves necessarily the proper administration of law, as well as the making of law. For so long as mankind remained under the dominion of selfishness and egotism, law in some form of restraint must continue to exist. Christianity and civilization, with all they have done for the world and all their discoveries, improvements, and elevating influences, have not yet raised man so high or made him so near the angels that he can be safely left to the full dominion of his passions. Consequently, governments have no more important problem to solve than that involved in deciding how far to apply the restraints of law and in what manner to apply them consistent, consistently with a proper degree of individual and political liberty. The supporters of those governments where the sovereignty of the people is denied, that is, in the, pope, the papal system, and where nothing but force is relied on to secure the administration of law, make a great and radical mistake. They seem incapable of realizing the fact that law can only constitute a just and proper rule of action when it is made responsive to a pre-existing public sentiment. In other words, when it is adopted, excuse me, when it is adapted to the condition of the society to be governed by it. In the absence of this, all laws must remain inoperative and ineffectual unless force is invoked to compel their execution. When the fundamental laws of a country, that is, those embodied in its civil and political institutions, are thus framed, there must necessarily be an entire absence of popular liberty. Thus, in a monarchy where the principle of popular representation does not exist, and the people are not consulted about the laws, obedience to them is enforced by some superior power, and fear alone restrains resistance. But in a republic like ours, where virtue and intelligence are stimulated by the structure of both government and society, the fundamental laws are not only executed, but preserved without force, because they have their foundation in the consent of the people. Therefore, under monarchical absolutism, under the papal form of government, the citizen feels but little sense of personality, while in the freedom of a republic he feels it in so high a degree as to develop his manhood and cause him to realize the individual interest he has in continuing the institutions which secure to him both defense and protection. 
all mankind derive from nature the right to be free. And what, whatever restraints are put upon this right by law are only such as the interest and necessities of society require. Those who share in society consent, in return for its protection, to be governed by such laws. Hence, property, proper, excuse me, popular liberty does not proceed from law, is not the result of it. Wherever it is found in written statutes, it is there because the people have risen up to the point of asserting it against the antagonism of monarchy, of snatching it from the hands of those who deny it to them and would retain the means of withholding it by defeating all of its civil guarantees. It is the expression of their political faith, the avowal of their determination to exist as a society or a nation freed from all the restraints of arbitrary power. Arbitrary power. That's the word that R.W. Thompson uses to describe popery. Arbitrary power. And it says, hence, it is truthfully said that, quote, liberty does not dwell in the palaces of kings. Unquote. Let me read it again. Liberty does not dwell in the palaces of kings. And I will add the word, and popes, because it, it is the popes who rule over the kings of this earth. So saith God in the Scriptures. There is no liberty in popery. There is no liberty in monasticism. There is no liberty in the Roman Catholic Church or its papal form of government. It is tyranny. It is slavery. And it is antithesis to Protestantism. Continuing, he says, It is equally true that it exists in the hearts and consciences of every free man. In this sense, it is a personal and inalienable right which each man must assert for himself. In a broader sense, it becomes a whole community, and each individual of a community is under the same obligation to assert and maintain it for those who share it with him as for himself. It thus becomes a political right requiring combined action to continue its existence. In other words, liberty must be defended. It's not the default mode. It must be defended. It's under attack constantly by popery and, and, and demagoguery. Liberty must be defended and demanded and secured by the people who desire liberty. When as the result of this combined action, political institutions are formed to provide for its preservation as in the United States, they necessarily exclude all idea of force and rest upon the consent of the governed. That's what we have here in the United States. That's what ideally we have, the consent of the governed. Shall we exchange that for popery? That's exactly what we're doing in the United States of America. It's called the New World Order. Now, before the break, we were talking about the free government of the United States must be defended. The free institutions, the Protestant institutions of America, a government that is, that is controlled by the people, in theory, should be defended. It is people-centered. It is conscience-centered. No force is required to enforce the laws of this country because the people naturally acquiesce to obedience to the laws because they are of their own making. That is never the case in a monarchical form of government, in a popish form of government. Now, sometimes, the author continues, 
Sometimes, as in the granting of Magna Carta and other charters by the English crown, governments profess to have conferred liberty. Think about that for a minute. This is an important concept. Everybody talks about the Magna Carta, but remember it was the English crown that granted liberty. Now, they use the same strategy as popery. If popery grants liberty, or popery grants a crown to be placed upon a king's head so that he can rule over the people, the pope can withdraw that crown, can't he? Same goes with the Magna Carta. If a government grants freedom, it may take it away because it, because it claims to be the author of that freedom. So Magna Carta isn't a panacea. It's only when the people demand freedom and put their governments into subjection do they really have freedom. Now, again, it says sometimes in the granting, uh, as in the granting of Magna Carta and other charters by the English crown, governments profess to have conferred liberty. But properly viewed, this is an absurdity. For to assert that a government has the right to confer or withhold it as it pleases is to deny its existence under the law of nature. All these are familiar truisms, but it is because they are true and their truth is recognized in every heart that they give birth to the, quote, firm and resolute spirit in which the liberal mind is always prepared to resist indignities and to refer its safety to itself, unquote. Where the form of government is an absolute monarchy, laws proceed from the sole and independent will of the ruler, whether he be called emperor, king, or pope and rely wholly upon force for their execution. But where the form is republican or democratic, as with us, no such force is required, because the obedience of the citizen springs from his own consent. Between these two opposing systems of government, our revolutionary fathers were obliged to make a selection that in choosing the latter they acted wisely and well. Every man who is worthy of free citizenship will maintain. Their example has already shorn monarchy of much of its strength, and it is not the time now when absolutism is trembling in the presence of popular representation to abate our veneration of their memory and our affection for their work. Some of the leading nations exist in an intermediate state between these two forms. They have united the representative with the monarchical principle, but only so far as to make some unavoidable concessions to the popular sentiment of liberty and not far enough to recognize its just and proper measure of influence upon society or entirely to dispense with the presence of force. These governments have advanced somewhat from a condition of absolutism, some of them less readily and rapidly than others, according as the fear of the people has been weaker or stronger in the minds of their despotic rulers. To trace out and observe the influences produced upon the world by these opposing systems of government, and to understand the nature and extent of their results, furnishes the thoughtful mind a true conception of the philosophy of history. In the pursuit of such an inquiry, however, the, the friends of free popular government must not concede to the advocates of absolutism that the times in which we live are suited for additional experiments in the art of governing in order to decide which form of political institutions is most conducive to human happiness. These experiments have already and sufficiently been made, and all of them combine to prove what this philosophy of history teaches, that the freer and more popular the government, the happier 
and more prosperous are the people. In such governments where civil institutions are established for themselves by an intelligent and virtuous people, force is never required to secure the execution of the fundamental laws. Where there is a power superior to the people prescri uh, to prescribe the laws, so much force is always necessary that liberty cannot exist in its presence. The people of the United States have nothing to fear or to lose by the closest scrutiny of their institutions, especially in the light of the lessons of history and past experiments in government. The unbiased judgment of the civilized world, in the absence of the fear of coercive authority, will agree with them in the opinion that the form of government which gives the greatest elevation to society is that in which all the fundamental laws reflect an intelligent, popular will. Therefore, we may well regard such a form as central among the governments of the earth, as the sun is the center of the planetary system, we may extend the figure one step further without the exhibit of an undue degree of national vanity, for if the light which it sends out over the nations were obscured, it would inevitably lead to the complete triumph of imperialism, as all nature would be darkened if the light of the sun were extinguished." Accordingly, as we are the advocates of absolutism or of popular government, we will condemn or approve the theory of American government. The absolutists insist that each step in the departure of nations from the monarchical form is receding to that from the true point of national elevation, that it is an abandonment of legitimate authority, that it is a passion, vertigo, delirium, madness, the excess of unlicensed and destructive revolution, a blind exercise of the mere physical power to do wrong in violation of the divine law. With him, the fewer who direct the destiny of a nation and control its government, the better, because by keeping the multitude in subjection, they hold them to the steady line of duty. Unlimited dominion on the part of the ruler and passive obedience on the part of the people are with all the supporters of absolutism and the ne plus ultra of government. Of those who reason thus, there are two classes, masters and slaves. The latter are so disciplined into subjection by the former that they seem incapable of comprehending the nature and extent of their degradation and suppose themselves to be relieved from the galling of their chains or to be compensated for its endurance by the belief that their servitude is the highest and the noblest exhibition of fidelity and duty. The former maintain their superiority with an entire disregard for the humiliation they create and cling to their ideas of human and national advancement in the face of the present condition of the world as if, they re as if they regarded ambition the highest motive of the mind and its gratification the greatest of all human achievements. Socrates probably, both of these, uh, Socrates probably had both of these classes in mind when he said, quote, that every master should pay... Uh, excuse me, quote, that every master should pray he may not meet with such a slave, and every such person, being unfit for liberty, should implore that he may meet with a merciful master, unquote. If all the world were divided into these two classes, monarchy, secure of its place upon the papal and other thrones, would have an easy time of it for there then would be only the oppressor and the oppressed. Quote, the oppressor who demands, and the oppressed who dare not resist. Unquote. 
Fortunately for us and the world, the framers of our institutions belong to neither of these classes. By their training in the school of Protestantism, they were endowed with the courage to defy both the authority and the machinations of those who claimed the divine right to govern. Their careful study of the history of nations enabled them to comprehend fully the necessities of their condition. They had realized how abject mankind had become in those countries where church and state were united, and with this experience to guide them, signalized their efforts to frame a new government. By dissolving this union, uh, by dissolving this union, speaking of church and state, as an unnatural and corrupting one. Ecclesiastical tyranny, such as popery and intolerance, were finally expelled, and Protestantism reached a degree of development for which it had been struggling for more than 200 years. Thomas Jefferson took an, an early opportunity to congratulate the people of the United States upon their, quote, having banished from our land that religious intolerance under which mankind so long bled and suffered, unquote, and under the sanction of his official position, declared that among the great principles which, quote, guided our steps through an age of revolution and reformation, unquote, were those which inculcated, quote, the diffusion of information, and arraignment of all abuses at the bar of public reason, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, unquote. And he addressed to us this admonition, quote, The wisdom of our sages and the blood of our heroes have been devoted to their attainment. They should be the creed of our political faith, the text of civic instruction, the touchstone by which to try the, the services of those we trust, and should we wander from them in moments of error and alarm, let us hasten to retrace our steps and to regain the road which alone leads to peace, liberty, and safety." Unquote. James Madison, when officially declaring the purposes for which our government was formed, enumerated among them the duty, quote, to avoid the slightest interference with the rights of conscience or the functions of religion, so wisely exempted from civil jurisdiction, to preserve in their full energy the other salutary provisions in behalf of private and personal rights and of the freedom of the press, unquote. We enjoy freedom of the press here at Inquisition Update and First Amendment Radio. I demand, I preserve to myself my First Amendment right to condemn both the Pope and the King who he controls. And until that right is taken away from me by taking my life, I'm going to demand that my government leave to me the God-given right to find fault with the biblical and historical Antichrist and to condemn his form of government and to shake off the chains of his bondage. I am free in Christ. I am born of the Spirit of God. I have a conscience rooted in the Scriptures. I need no pope. I have a king, and I have a kingdom. He's benevolent, and I love him, and he's righteous and holy. I do not need a pope. I do not need an ecumenical spirit of unity with the biblical and historical Antichrist, and I demand that our government, this government that was once Protestant and free, shake off the bonds of popery and put Christ back in the center of our government. You can't find Christ in a popish government because he presumes to replace Christ both in your heart and on the land. 
despotism is coming to the United States of America because we don't understand how much power the Pope is applying upon our government by divine right, so-called. Now, the author continues, he says, These sentiments were not alone expressed by these great statesmen. Words of like import were uttered by many of their com compatriots. They were but the echo of those existing in the minds of the people and were embodied in their national constitution. In these words, listen carefully. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of Roman Catholicism or prohibiting the free exercise of, of Protestantism. That's how I read it. They knew popery was oppression, that it was an exclusion of Christ. It was a bondage and a torturer of God's people. Congress, those who we elect to represent us in Washington, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances, unquote. Upon such foundations as this, the superstructure of our government now rests. So long as these principles shall be preserved, the government will stand. Whenever they shall be abandoned, it will fall. And I will just add, and great will be the fall of it. The author continues, they must therefore be guarded with the same ceaseless care as that which we, we, we guard our own lives. For we have no more right to lose by neglect than we have to strike down with the sword of rebellion the civil and the religious institutions of a free people. Of a free people. Why would we give up our freedom and liberty for popery? Why would we exchange Protestantism for despotism? Why would we give up Christ for Antichrist? It's just that simple, people. And the ecumenical movement represents the surrender as error of Protestantism for the divine right of the Pope to rule this country. And if you are attending an ecumenical church whose mantra is peace and unity, you are being duped. You are being lured into the chains of bondage to the Pope of Rome. Christ will not be your king. The Pope will demand your full obedience in direct contradistinction to the Bible and to Christ. It may look like the right thing to do. What could possibly be wrong with peace and unity? Would you try to make peace and unity with a bloodthirsty lion? That's what Rome is when she is in full control and history repeated proof of that assertion. We fail to comprehend history, and now we're about to repeat it. And the rivers of this great nation, this once Protestant nation, will run red with the blood of God's people, just as the rivers of the world have run red with their blood for the centuries that the Pope has persecuted them. Those who fail to remember history are doomed to repeat it. 
Why can't we learn the lesson? Renounce the ecumenical movement. Renounce popery. Grab your authorized King James Bible and the Christ who wrote it and demand your liberty in Him. And overthrow every politician in this country who throws off the rulership of the people in favor for the rulership of the Pope. No Roman Catholic in this country should sit in a seat of power in government because their first loyalty is to their Antichrist in Rome. And their purpose is to overthrow this free and Protestant government and to replace it with papal dictatorship by divine right. And they believe they're doing God's service. When they kill you, they will believe they are doing God's service. That's the opposition. It's time we recognize it, we acknowledge it, and we fight against it with God's help. Now, we'll go to chapter 3 of this most prophetic and intelligent book, The Papacy and the Civil Power. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the war against Protestantism. We're going to talk about Roman Catholic literature and intolerance. In this chapter, the author is going to talk about the Bible being closed. He's going to talk about the Spanish Inquisition and how it is justified in the Roman Catholic mind. We're going to talk about re uh, freedom of thought denounced as sin by the popes. We're going to talk about tracts in favor of the Pope's infallibility that were un uh, and universal supremacy in faith and morals being distributed all over the world, even in this country. We're going to talk about morals involved politics, the, the index expurgatorius, that is the, the, the index of forbidden books. That's right. If you're Roman Catholic, you can't read certain books. There's no freedom of the press in Roman Catholicism. You must understand that. Freedom of the press in this country is a Protestant concept that is renounced as heresy by the papacy. All information is to be controlled by the papacy in a papal system. He's going to talk about the condemnation and punishment of Galileo as an example of popish supremacy. He's going to talk about the Spanish Inquisition, the blood of God's people shed by papists throughout history. He's going to talk about the Middle Ages preferred to the present times. Why was the Middle Ages preferred by the popes? Because they ruled supreme. And what do the popes hate so much about the present time? Because the present time is influenced by liberty, by Protestantism the only lethal weapon that ever nearly toppled the papacy was Protestantism. That is the target of this modern age going into the 21st century and the creation of a new world order for the Pope. We'll talk about it tomorrow.